Okay, so we're back. I wanted to get back to this Hassock Chain lecture, series of lectures that we've been working our way through about pragmatism and philosophy of science, something that's very interesting. So we're only part way through the very first lecture. I'm also trying to get a hang of this audio. Someone said that my audio was low, so I, I tried to move the mic closer to me. <laughs> Can you hear me? <clears throat> Do you want to hear me? <laughs> I would also love to figure out how to make it full screen in here without, if I do that, I don't think you can see anything on the video. I know there's a way to do it in here. Anyway, okay. So I'm pretty sure this is where I left it right where we left off. We're going to jump right back in. All we've been talking about is what is pragmatism. We've now watched the Putnam lectures. And it really wasn't about pragmatism but it was or philosophy of science, but about naive realism and quality. I thought it would be more about this, but it wasn't. So um, I'm generally on board. Uh, I went and read the Stanford Encyclopedia on pragmatism, tried to refresh my memory on some of this stuff. So... And I think that he's going to argue for a kind of pluralism. So I'm pretty much, I think, on board with pragmatism as a theory of knowledge and science, if this is where this is going. So I like what I'm hearing. Let's go ahead and jump right back into it. There's much more to say about all that, but I think I've said enough. Mm -hmm. There's um, tomorrow morning. Now, I think um, there's much oh. more to say about all okay. that, but I think I've said enough. Okay. I hope I've said enough by now to convince you that pragmatism provides a productive framework for the philosophical analysis of the nature of scientific knowledge. If so, the next step is to articulate that framework in a more precise and usable way. And that is one of the main contributions that I want to make in order to give more significance to practical realism and other similar doctrines. Now, one way to express the same is to say that I want to know what pragmatism implies for the practice of philosophy of science. Not only pragmatism talking about scientific practice, but you know, if we are pragmatists, how should we do philosophy? What do we actually do when we practice epistemology in a pragmatist way, and what are the benefits of that? In some previous publications, I have proposed that scientific work, as well as non-scientific but knowledge-related aspects of living, can be analyzed in terms of what I called epistemic activities and systems of practice in conscious opposition to the more customary analysis of scientific knowledge as consisting of propositions. And I try to uh, motivate that move um, in the earlier part of this lecture. So now, now let's be a little bit more precise about this. Those of you who've read the uh, Is Water H2O book have already seen these formulations. But for the rest of you, I repeat. An epistemic activity um, defined as a more or less coherent set of mental or physical operations that are intended to contribute to the production or improvement of knowledge in a particular way. I think I'm going to have to add the use of knowledge here as well, but it's something I'm thinking about. And it's done in accordance with some discernible rules, although the rules may be unarticulated. Now, there are three important things to note immediately about the kind of analysis uh, that's based on the notion of epistemic activities, what I'm going to refer to as activity-based analysis of scientific practice. First, uh, when we think in terms of activities, we keep in mind clearly the aims that scientists are trying to achieve in each and every situation. Again, not just scientists, but everyone who's doing anything. The presence and operation of an identifiable aim, again, even if the aim is not explicitly articulated by the actors themselves, um, 
it, this is what distinguishes actions and activities from mere physical happenings involving body parts. I mean, when we say something is an activity, when we say somebody is taking an action, there has to be a, a recognizable aim. Right? And that's very important, I think. This is something that's so often missing in the standard analysis of science by philosophers. What, what are these people trying to achieve when they're doing their science? And philosophers often ju just don't think about that. We, we sort of assume in an unreflective way, of course, they must be trying to reach the truth. But in fact, very often scientists are not even trying to do that. So we'll talk about more of that kind of thing in more detail. That is a good point. Yes, very good point. Till later. The second point I want to emphasize is that once we start thinking about epistemic activities, it's very easy to note the presence of very diverse types of activities present in scientific practice. So let's think again in specific terms. What kind of things do scientists do when they do science? For example, if you look at the work of the historian of science, John Pickstone, um, taught at Manchester University for a long time, and he's following Alistair Crombie and Ian Hacking here. Uh, he identifies some important types of scientific practices, which he calls one postulation in axiomatic sciences, two experimental exploration and measurement of complex detectable relations, three hypothetical modeling, four ordering of variety by comparison and taxonomy, five, statistical analysis of populations, and six, historical derivations of genetic development. I mean, very different kinds of things that, that we routinely engage in in scientific um, practice. Right? Now, these methodologies that Pickston identifies are specific and complex syntheses of a number of different kinds of basic epistemic activities. The more basic activities could be conceived under headings such as describing something or predicting something or explaining or hypothesizing, testing, observing, detecting, measuring, classifying, representing, modeling, simulating, synthesizing and analyzing, abstracting and idealizing. The, the, the list goes on there. So many kinds of epistemic activities that we engage in. And we need to start right, analyzing what happens when we do each of these things. It's going to be a lot of work to do. Third, most epistemic activities have physical, mental, and social dimensions simultaneously. Some types of epistemic activities may seem primarily physical and others primarily mental. However, Making anything work in science will need to involve an active integration of the physical and the mental within a well-defined social setting. Let me just give you one example. Take something that's usually considered by philosophers perhaps as far removed from actions as possible, the definition of a concept. But I want to write, let's ask not about the nouns, but the verbs, not about definitions, but defining. What do we have to do in order to give a definition of a concept? So what does one do in order to define a scientific term? We have to do lots of different things. First, we have to formulate formal conditions for the correct verbal and mathematical use of the concept. We have to construct physical instruments and procedures for measurement standard tests, and other manipulations. We also have to organize people, preferably into a committee, to monitor the agreed use of the concept and devise also methods to punish people who don't adhere to such agreed uses. In one stroke, we have brought into consideration all kinds of unexpected things, ranging from operationalism to the sociology of scientific institutions. Something like, you know, one meter or one kilogram would not and could not mean what it means without a whole variety of epistemic actions coordinated and regulated by the body called the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, 
Mm -hmm. right? A global yeah. organization headquartered in Paris, maintained by an international treaty initially negotiated more than 100 years ago. Again, even semantics is a matter of doing, as Wittgenstein and the pragmatist taught us a long time ago. So, mm -hmm. how each epistemic <laughs> activity works is complex enough. In addition, we must note that epistemic activities normally do not and should not occur in isolation. Rather, each one tends to be practiced in relation to some others, constituting together a whole system. A scientific system of practice is formed by a coherent and interacting set of epistemic activities performed with a view to achieve certain aims. It is the overall aims of a system of practice that define what it means for the system to be coherent. Let me illustrate briefly with an example, which uh, workshop participants have seen in chapter one of my book. Right? Antoine Lavoisier, at the end of the 18th century, created a new system of chemistry whose main activities included making various chemical reactions involving gases, tracking chemical substances through weight measurement, classifying compounds according to their compositions, and analyzing organic substances by combustion. This system had an overall aims, which included determining the composition of various substances and explaining chemical reactions in terms of the composition of the substances. So when you try to analyze um, a phase of science in this way, I hope you can see the, the real difference between this way of looking at what Lavoisier is doing and the usual philosopher's way of saying, right, Lavoisier had the oxygen theory of chemistry. Was it true or not true? Was it at least more true than the phlogiston theory or not? That just loses the entire depth and complexity and real excitement, I would even say, of this kind of practice. The coherence of a system goes beyond mere consistency between propositions involved in its activities. Rather, coherence consists in various activities coming together in an effective way towards the achievement of the aims of the system. Now, coherence is going to be the main topic of tomorrow's lecture, so I won't uh, go on much more about that. It may be instructive to draw a comparison and contrast between my notion of systems of practice and Kuhn's notion of paradigms. Mm -hmm. So there are some clear similarities, but there are also significant differences, which was enough to uh, make me make up a new concept. Right? I was trying to do with Kuhn's paradigms, but it just didn't work. Why? As Kuhn freely admitted, he used the term paradigm in two main senses, which were very different. The first um, was an exemplar, right? A very successful instance of scientific work which other people try to emulate, right? Uh, this just didn't fit into what I was trying to express um, with my notion of systems. The second sense, uh, what Kuhn called the disciplinary matrix, is akin to my concept, but um, for two reasons I don't find it helpful. First, I think we need a concept much more definite and orderly than the Kuhnian paradigm as disciplinary matrix, which incorporated all kinds of elements from ranging from fundamental metaphysical principles to institutional structures, with no definite indication of how the whole thing holds together. I mean, I think scientific practice does incorporate all those things, but Kuhn didn't tell you how exactly they fitted together. Kuhn's paradigm concept is also too closely tied to his view of scientific development, which maintained that a paradigm should enjoy a monopoly over an entire scientific discipline in normal phases of science. I have both descriptive and normative objections to that presumption of monopoly. That, that's you know, my pluralism, which I'll return to in the last lecture. So I don't want to focus too much uh, on the discussion of Kuhn right now. The main point is that systems of practice, I hope, provide the right kind of unit of analysis when we are discussing many crucial issues in the philosophy of science, such as theory choice, realism, pluralism, and progress. 
Now, just one final set of notes about these notions of activities and practices, uh, systems. You may have noticed that the mention of aims and coherence occur in my characterization of both epistemic activities and systems of practice. I'm particularly worried about the coherence thing, which wasn't explained very well in the first place. This may enhance the sense some of you might have that um, there, there's the levels of description uh, quite confused here. So you might ask, um, isn't each epistemic activity in itself a system of ac activities? Doesn't combustion analysis, for example, consist of various simpler activities such as burning something, uh, absorbing the combustion product using other chemicals, weighing those um, uh, resulting um, compounds, and making percentage calculations. That's how Lavoisier was analyzing organic compounds in terms of how much oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen were contained in each. And isn't it the case that even those simpler activities in themselves consist of yet simpler activities? So if you ju take uh, just the act of um, in a weighing, right? Uh, doesn't it now consist in the placing of samples and standard weights on the pans of a balance, reading the number of the scale? So, I mean, it looks like every time you pick up an activity, it actually consists in a whole other set of, a set of whole other activities. Um, there's no clear end to this pro pro process of activity analysis. And I don't think you would gain very much by attempt to, attempting to reach a rock bottom of atomic activities. I'm not going to go deeply into the metaphysics of action and activities today. The point is that when I distinguish higher and lower levels of description, that's only relative and context dependent. There's no lowest level of description, uh, nor absolutely more or less complex activities. So that's the spirit in which I employ the terminology of epistemic activity and system of practice. So in each situation in which we study a body of scientific practice, I'm proposing to call the overall aspect, uh, overall object a system, the big circle in that picture. Um, so I'm calling it a system when it's desired that we should study more closely different aspects of that system, uh, which I call um, epistemic activities, and then when we want to study more in more detail what each activity consists of, <laughs> calling um, the littler things operations. Uh, this is terminology I used in uh, a separate paper, and the picture is helpfully drawn by my commentators, Lena Sole and Regis Catino, who said, this is too confusing, we need a picture. <laughs> but the point is that, um, you know, where you are focusing your attention, the thing you want to study ought to be identified as the system, and then you can drill down. So this way, my framework is applicable at all levels and can be zoomed in and out to suit any place that we want to focus on. So um, I'm just giving you that in case you, you had this problem, which I myself had um, when I was writing this. So this multi-level analysis is done without implying a reductionist metaphysics of action in which a system is made by a simple addition of various activities which do not really have any connection with each other. So this picture isn't perfect because it is not showing the linkages and the coherence between the different elements, but we'll talk more about that tomorrow. The structure of actions and processes are not atomistic unlike the structure of things and statements. So just for a quick example, the activity, so go back to the activity of weighing stuff in a balance, and we talked about the sub-activity or operation of placing a standard weight on one side, right, to balance out the thing you want to weigh, right? But even this apparently simple thing, right, the activity of placing standard weights on a balanced pan 
inevitably includes activities supporting our assumption that what we are handling are indeed the correct standard weights. Right? So that actually has this sub-activity of certification, right? which may consist in ordering the weights from a reliable supplier or it may consist in comparing them to a more trusted set of weights, which you already know are good, or checking them against certain natural phenomena, for example, the weight of a certain volume of water at a certain temperature. Whichever of these options we go with, it's clear that this subordinate activity of certifying the standard weights we use is in no way simpler than the main activity of weighing with a balance. So that, that's the way in which the composition of actions and activities is really not atomistic. Interesting. So the relation between various epistemic activities is ultimately non-reductive and it is reticular, a net-like structure. Although in many situations we can gain uh, some useful insights by thinking of an activity as made up of various components. So um, that, that's all I'm going to say for now about you know, how we do activity-based analysis of scientific practice. And if you forget everything else, carry home the sense that it's really quite complicated. <laughs> it's not so simple as writing down a theory as a set of propositions and right. asking, is it true? Right. It takes a lot more to understand what actually happens. Yeah, I think that's an important and good point. Uh, so far, 100% in agreement. No, no. Goes in science. So no let problems. me um, summarize what we've uh, done so far and quickly anticipate tomorrow's lecture. So I presented to you uh, the idea of pragmatism as the study of epistemic action, right, by which I mean, what we actually do in order to gain and use knowledge. I mean, and that's, that's the main point I want you to, well, the three main points. The first one, this is what, why I care about pragmatism. This is why I think it's relevant to philosophy of science. In the second main part of this lecture, I try to make an argument to the effect that we should see knowledge primarily as ability rather than primarily as information. I try to give you arguments for making that step. And then in the third part, I try to illustrate how one actually does this activity-based analysis or operational analysis of scientific practice. Again, the emphasis is on thinking about what, uh, what do we actually do when we gain knowledge? What do we actually do when we try to make knowledge better? What do we actually do when we use knowledge and when we test it and when we make arguments about what kind of knowledge is good? What do we actually do? That, that's always the question. I, I'm saying it over and over to just fix it in your head. What do we actually do? So in the next lecture, I'm going to give a focused discussion of the concept of coherence which um, I already admitted was, was not very well characterized in my book. Uh, it's going to be crucial to the understanding. I have to say, truth as coherence is something I've never been friendly towards. But uh, I'm interested to see how he develops this. Ending of how epistemic activities work out. And here, you know, I, I mean, this is crucial when I'm trying to move away from the propositional concept of knowledge. Because right? with the propositional concept, what you have to do is quite clear. Right? You, you have certain propositions that you want to believe in, and you have to check if these propositions correspond to reality. Or if you're uh, some other kind of philosopher, you say you have a whole bunch of propositions you believe and you want to at least check their mutual consistency. But that's a logical relation. We know how to check that. What do I mean by coherence of an activity? I mean, this is what I'm going to try to spell out tomorrow because I know in um, terms of what I've already published, it's not clear. And this is what I'm trying to work out. So uh, the second half of 
tomorrow's lecture will then be using the concept of coherence, which I want to clarify, um, to have a new pragmatist definition of truth which again is going to be crucial if uh, the kind of pragmatism I'm trying to advance is going to work as a doctrine of epistemology. So I've gone on a little bit longer than I planned. Thank you for your patience with that. And I, we still have a little bit of time for questions, I think. So thank cool. you. I wonder if they have the questions here. Oh, yeah. OK, cool. Yes. Uh, and he says uh, it would be hard, but we will be able to reconstruct all our technology and all our, all our uh, no, uh, mm -hmm. concrete knowledge about things that we use to produce further knowledge by using the propositional knowledge. Yeah. And uh, almost four years later. So I can't really hear. I don't know if you guys can, but I think the questioner is talking about Popper. And the thought experiment about Popper's idea that if we lost all of our technology and know-how that we have right now, all the stuff that uh, Chang is talking about, in other words, all these activities, if we lost all that, that we could reconstruct them from propositional knowledge. Therefore, maybe propositional knowledge has got some more important role to play. Is that the role? I think that's what the questioner is going for. There, uh, uh -huh. turn the argument upside down. Uh -huh. So they try to flip the thought experiment around. Libraries ex are destroyed. Then we could reconstruct the libraries with the practices. So. Just to say, uh, it seems to me that your philosophical argument is like uh, in part goes in parallel with either two. I mean, more with Baird. Uh, yeah, it's more more with Baird. Yeah. Yes, but not entirely. I think. Okay. Right. So. What I don't know who Barrett is. Um, I thought he said Popper. Maybe there's two, two camps. One camp saying you have propositional knowledge first, then you get know-how. Then the other one saying you have know-how, then you get propositional knowledge. So he, he's saying he's not really on either side. Okay, I wish they could hear. I could hear a little better. Let's say about that experiment is if we just had the libraries, but not, nothing material left, yes, by working very hard, with the text, we will be able to reinvent all the instruments and other technological apparatus. No guarantee, but I think we will be able to do it. But I think the situation is symmetric. If you only had the apparatus, I think it would be also uh, required to have put in some really hard work right, to generate the propositional knowledge um, that the libraries used to contain. Yeah, uh, the, the, the real question was, it, it seems that this sort of counterfactual uh, thought experiment uh, would work either way. Uh, but yeah, so that, that was it. Hold on, yeah, that's what I thought the guy was saying, or whoever this is, that it go, can go either way. It's kind of, you know, question begging. It's not clear which way you go. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So he's asking, why is one the basis of the other as opposed to they depend on each other or something, other relationship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I understand. Uh, 
the question and why you might consider a feedback loop is better. Um, the bigger picture I want to draw is this, and it partly derives from Ryan. Um, I think the Popper versus Baird kind of opposition is founded on this, this traditional idea of theory versus practice. And I think that's quite unhelpful, right? Because there is a lot of things that I would call theoretical practice, right? So when we say we've got the libraries, right? We also imply that we know how to read. Yeah. Right? It's not just the propositions uh, that are contained in the books that we have left. No, we, we have a lot of actually uh, non-propositional knowledge in knowing how to use the books. Right? And this is the kind of thing Ryan was trying to really convey when he said um, knowing how is prior logically to knowing that. And, and I think something like that is right. Now, you could make things more symmetric by having a fuller, more contextual understanding of propositions and the roles they play. And that's the sort of work that J.L. Austin did, right? Yes, uh, exactly. Which is now you know, alive and well in terms of elocutionary act and so on uh, in the philosophy of language. So, you know, that's one way to do it by saying, ah, yeah, propositions aren't just pieces of information. Exactly. So <clears throat> if you don't know the elocutionary act, elocutionary, locutionary, perlocutionary language comes from philosophy of language. So one utterance may be conveying information, issuing a warning, or expressing your emotion or some other thing. Depends either on the intuitions, that's more Gricean, or conventions, that's more Austinian. But the idea that, yes, these uh, these things are not just propositional in that sense is important, I agree. Uh -huh, okay. Right, they, they are um, whole units of practice, in fact. But yeah, I that's think the that, that's harder to do, and, and we can discuss why mm. that's harder. That, that's the sort of thing we can pick up in the morning. Right. Thank you. Okay. Did I understand correctly that it's a point you said, I think, quoting Ryan or paraphrasing Ryan, that um, one way in which uh, knowledge how is uh, largely prior to knowledge that is that you don't really know that P if you don't know what to do with P. Is that something you said? Or? Uh, not exactly, but something Ryle was saying is that uh, you can be in possession of a proposition, but um, you may know what to do with it or you may not, right? You, you may simply take it as information and yeah, you would have to say you know that fact, but um, what he called the workshop possession as opposed to the museum mm -hmm. possession. Right. That, yeah, that would involve knowing how to do various things using this piece of information. Right. So it wasn't an argument for the priority of know-how. That was just a distinction that you made. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that goes into the uh, other part. I think the questioner said, so it wasn't an argument for your view, but just a distinction that Ryle made. Right. Uh, let's see if I can... Sorry. Uh, yeah, so that point goes into this, right? How knowledge as information actually goes, contributes to the making of knowledge as ability. The, the priority is this other point. So it is in opposite directions, yes. Yes, thanks. Uh, -huh. uh, you had in, in the beginning one of your slides, you had kind of contemporary pragmatists who were kind of moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, one you didn't mention, or the only one you didn't mention was Cheryl Misak. Uh, oh. The one you had, and perhaps it was yes. an accident. But that was an accident. That <laughs> I don't know uh, the word that well, but I've read some. Uh, she has this kind of recent book, The American Pragmatist. Mm -hmm. And um, at least kind of the impression I got out of it, and in that she kind of criticizes Julie to some extent, mm -hmm. I got more impression that, you, that she was kind of a more kind of traditional realist kind of 
truth with the big T. A bit. Ah, so uh, yeah, like, yeah, mm. yeah. And pragmatist too. Interesting. Yeah, my text actually did mention Mishak. I'm sorry I left her out, but I mean, she starts with her deep knowledge of purse, right? And she has, right, a particular way of interpreting purse, which I think is more congenial to my views than how other people interpret purse. But I mean, something, yeah, yeah. Because uh, what I don't like in purse is his notion, right, that truth um, is convergence of belief in the long run. Yeah. And that to me seems just as mm. inoperable <laughs> as the real traditional realist correspondence because the long run never comes, <laughs> right? Yeah. But she thinks that um, purse should be read in. I mean, this is a fundamental point, right? So will you ever get to the, <clears throat> to the end of science? People like me tend to think, yeah, it's conceivable that there is an end of science. But also people like me tend to think it's conceivable that maybe there isn't. So I really am on the fence here. Uh, I get caught up arguing a lot with anti-physicalists who have a deep commitment to this other view. And so therefore I end up talking that way a lot. And I do find it sort of, <clears throat> you know, partially congenial to my views, but so I find this other view also, it's good to have this reminder from the other side. <laughs> A different way, which is much more like mm. what I'm saying. So th that's on the reading list. I, I must, uh, yeah, get to that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your great talk lecture. Um, um, I was wondering because um, your explanation of pragmatic realism sounds a bit absolute to me. A bit absolute. Absolute. Uh -huh. Because um, uh, yes. Uh, pragmatic solution for the problem of induction, for example, Hans Langenbach's uh, solution. All the papers, well, well so, uh, seems most uh, feasible, feasible solution for scientific practice. But uh, although it may be a bit of topic for this lecture, could you, sub could you provide a non-pragmatic uh, approach in the scientific uh, practice? In your, in your opinion. Wait, what? Okay, that's a weird question. So the first question is his view sounds a bit absolute, which sounds, I don't know where he got that from, but okay, we'll see what he has to say. And the second is, could you talk about a non-pragmatic theory? <laughs> it's a weird question, okay. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Okay. So, what you meant by absolute is uh, I'm only presenting one position, and uh -oh. yeah, yeah. What would be the alternative? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah good. Thank you. I see. Okay. And I, I think one alternative is what I was mentioning earlier. Um, you could really try to stick to the propositional view of knowledge, but make that much more contextual and much more tied with. Um, actions but i think once you start tying it with actions you move towards pragmatism in my view so that may be not such a that mm. may not be such a distinct uh, position you can write there are attempts responding particularly to ryle uh, that people have made uh, for example uh, jason stanley and and timothy williamson also paul snowden who try to reduce knowing how to knowing that and they say yeah yeah actually all we've got really is uh, descriptive knowledge right and you know they they have some valid arguments but i think they misunderstand right that's one of mm. the reasons why uh knowing how and knowing that is liable to objections right and that's why i do it as knowledge as ability versus information because what what these guys say is well i can tell you how to ride a horse without actually ever being able to do it right so i would give a description right you would first climb onto the horse you would <laughs> i actually don't know how to ride a horse it's so i'm not going to be very good at <laughs> describing that but i can describe to you how a bicycle is ridden
By the way, I do know how to ride a horse. I was raised around horses. My mom knows how to ride horses. My sister knows how to ride horses. I do not like riding horses. <laughs> right, because I do that all the time. And then they go into this typical analytic philosopher's move. Oh, and suppose now you who know very well how to ride a bicycle become paralyzed. And you can only think, but you should still be able to describe in your bed how bicycle riding is done. Okay, you can do that, but that's a description of the characteristics of an activity. That's not the same as knowing how to do something, right? So they're trading on the difference between how and how to. Well, they're, they're actually running the two together. Yes. Anyway, so that's one way to do it, right? To, to say, no, in the end, what looks like irreducibly non-propositional is in fact propositional in, in all important senses. Uh, so those would be uh, some of the alternatives. Yeah, I never really found that move all that convincing, that trying to reduce knowing how to knowing that. Although I know people who work on this and have made interesting arguments here. Um, I think I even have some videos from an old consciousness online conference about this exact topic. But in, not by me, but uh, yeah, okay, interesting. Which I'm Good in, answer. There are some of the alternatives I'm trying to argue against. Another way which I think is not good is to simply ignore all the um, ability and agency dimensions of knowledge, which is what a lot of philosophers do. And that I think is not acceptable because that by doing that, you, you just lose huge amounts of very interesting questions mm -hmm. that we should be asking about knowledge. Yeah, I'm going to grab on this question that you asked about the uh, what do you think about Harry Collins' account of classic knowledge? Uh-huh. Because Collins argues that there's a variety of classic knowledge. Ooh. Harry Collins, I don't know. Uh huh. Collins argues that there is a variety of classic knowledge, the social classic knowledge, that cannot be expressed in knowledge of the acquired. Mm -hmm. A social dimension yeah. that can't no, be I... expressed as a as an ability is that what is is that what's what they said? I, I think uh, Collins is one of the Collins. people who seriously try to right tackle this kind of question. I think he is right that. There are different kinds of uh, tacit knowledge. He also did some really interesting work with Martin Koch, right? The book called The Shape of Actions, uh, which is completely ignored both by philosophers of science and philosophers of action, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think Collins, I mean, I, Collins is one of the people I look at, but um, one question, I don't know. I think it, it, it may be, uh, I haven't made up my mind about this. I mean, especially with Polanyi's work, one question people got very excited about is whether um, some tacit knowledge was irreducibly tacit, right? That, that, that inarticulable in principle. Uh, and other things are tacit in the sense that you don't articulate them usually, but you can if you want, right? And Collins, um, I think, tried to engage with that question and, and to my mind wasn't very clear uh, about how to answer that question. But I, what I'm not sure about is whether that question is really that important, right? Um, because, partly because um, what can be, I mean, you might say all kinds of things can be articulated, but you can't do it all at the same time because there is too much. I think that's one of Collins's points, if I remember correctly. So um, maybe that's all we need to say about that. I, I'm not sure, but yeah, certainly um, I think it is important to distinguish um, different reasons for tacitness, right? Is it because we don't bother articulating? Is it because 
as Polanyi tried to argue with the bicycle riding, some things simply cannot be put into words and so on. And for me, the important point from Ryle to keep in mind is that in order to use language, we have to have non-verbal skills, right? And Polanyi had already made that point uh, in a different way, but, well, Ryle might have done it first anyway. I think that's a very important um, aspect to consider. Um, I'm not remembering Collins's taxonomy well enough to be able to say anything more useful than that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I have this worry that that connects to some previous questions. Yes. Uh, once you um, take this uh, this road to move it to some sort of ability, then you can, at one point at least you should start to give some account or elaborate <coughs> on what what is ability or what kind of ability. Mm -hmm. But what is ability and what kind of abilities? It seems that you have a whole lot of array of different abilities and it seems that we don't want to all of all those things to be knowledge. And when you start doing that... So some abilities shouldn't be counted as knowledge, he's arguing? Okay, or suggesting? But my worry is that this epistemology 101 that you want to get rid of, like what beliefs a person has and propositions, that's kind of comes back, comes back at back door. So he said you want to get rid of this basic epistemology, but it comes back. I don't think he wants to get rid of it. I think he wants to expand our idea of what counts as epistemology into these practice-based things. But uh, okay, let's see what he says. Once you start to give us a count on exactly what kind of abilities question. So once you start to say what the abilities are, he thinks propositional knowledge is going to come back, I think it's just... Hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I think what... Yeah, go on. I'm expecting you to give us a count of an ability test. What your, what's your share on thoughts? Or do you have... Um, uh, yeah, I may try to... It's got a slide. ...get into <laughs> this more tomorrow. I mean, so... It's this last item, right? It's the one he skipped. What? See, it's always the slide you skip. He had this up, and then he was like, oh, we could say more, and moved on. <laughs> Last one. Many kinds of knowing. See, okay, yeah. There's many kinds of knowing. Uh, he doesn't want to get rid of any, but uh, what it's like. All right, we like that. I didn't go into today because of time. I don't want to say that there's just knowing how or knowledge as ability. I think by the word no and similar words in many other languages, we mean a whole variety of things, right? So the full account of knowledge, I think we will have to say something about all of those things, right? So, I, you know, I mean, German speakers, first of all, know, right, the difference between Wissen and Kennen, right? It's that kind of difference, knowledge by acquaintance versus knowledge um, about something. Uh, I mean, there's knowing that and knowing how and how to, which is different. There's the question of knowing why something happens, which, which is a demand for explanation rather than information. And that's neither knowing how to do something nor simply knowing some information. There's uh, me looking at... Ave and saying, oh, I know her. And what does that mean? That's more like the German uh, canon. That's a different kind of thing. Do we, uh, we philosophers love this article, right, by Nagel? What is it like to be a bat? Now, what is it like to know that? <laughs> I think that's a certain kind of knowing, but that's a different kind of thing altogether. That's yep. more like empathetic understanding, right? So I think... The bigger picture is this, right? That there are all kinds of knowing, including knowing that, right? So it's certainly not the case that I want to get rid of propositional knowledge. I think there is propositional knowledge. Uh, when I say move away from it as a focus of philosophy of science, 
Um, that's exactly what I mean. It is there, <laughs> but we shouldn't be completely absorbed by considerations of knowledge that or knowledge as information. Uh, and I think one of the most interesting things to ask, right, is about the relationship between knowledge as ability and knowledge as information. My own sense is that, um, th yeah, they do have mutual influence, but um, there are these senses in which uh, knowing how or knowledge as ability seems both more prior, uh, not more prior, both prior more, yeah. to uh, knowledge that or knowledge as information and also more interesting right? <laughs> when we're trying to understand uh, practice. Francesco, you did say that yeah, in the sense that in order to learn and use language, he said you did say it's prior, right? Which you have to have non linguistic knowledge, right? Is that logically prior? I mean, do you have to have non linguistic knowledge? I mean, yeah, I know what he means. You have to have the ability to form the words and to move your tongue in the right way and to expel the air from your esophagus and. somehow pick the words which express the thought that you're trying to express all those things are true so you have to know how before you can know with language okay i mean that depends on what you mean by logic but okay if you mean first order predicate logic no right but in terms of you know what is actually required in order to do something, right? I mean, it's, can we say that we have propositional knowledge if we lack the understanding of the meaning of terms that occur in that proposition? And can we say that we understand the meaning of those terms if we do not have the practical understanding of the Wittgensteinian language games? that give meanings to those terms, right? That's how the thought goes. First of all, I deny this theory of meaning, <clears throat> language games and language uh, meaning as use and all that stuff. So I don't like all that stuff. There is use. I would say that has to do more with pragmatics, the speaker meaning, less than the meaning of the terms, but we don't need to get into a whole debate about that. That's a whole separate debate. Hopefully it's a whole separate debate. <laughs> so it's yeah, not logic in the narrow sense, but yeah. I, mean, I agree with you. Yeah. Because, because, I mean, the other thought, the uh, opposing thought is that, and then it seems that Gavin had this kind of knowledge that's knowledge about logic, for example, or mm -hmm. mathematics. It doesn't seem that in order to know the meanings of the, some mathematical elements or parts of logic, it seems that we have to know the connections between them, not something that is about what we do Well, I mean, Wittgenstein would tell you, you have to understand things like truth tables, right? Which means we have to know how to read a table. Logic doesn't teach you that, right? Logic doesn't teach you that this cell corresponds to that cell. You have to learn that some other way, how, right? How do you teach babies? and young children, how this works. It's not done by giving them a proposition and allowing them to deduce something else. It's done by, I don't know. It's really hard to do, right? <laughs> you point to things and they say, that's red. And they, they think it means you're pointing to an apple, right? This kind of thing, there's an infinite regress you hit if you try to do everything verbally. So if you're teaching language to someone who doesn't already have language, it's a miracle. <laughs> we all do it, but that's why it takes so long, right? And likewise, how did we first learn the really elementary 
aspect of arithmetic and set theory and uh, operating with symbols that we all do when we're that big, you know. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that <laughs> Wittgenstein and Ryle were talking about. Uh, and that's the sense of uh, being prior. I mean, there's stuff that's in this broad sense logically prior to even logic. Right? So I, th I think that's uh, one important aspect um, of this uh, pragmatic dimension of knowledge that I'm trying to get at. I, I'm not going to pretend I'm, I'm finished with that line of work, but I think Ryle and Wittgenstein were trying to tell us something quite important about that and that sort of got lost. Hmm. Very interesting. All right, let's go ahead and stop here because this is already getting way too long. Uh, we'll pick up with the next lecture uh, very soon because, like I said, I, there's parts. So, so far, I'm in almost 100% agreement with most of the things that have been said. In fact, I'd go further and say anyone who's ever worked in a laboratory immediately recognizes the importance, or should, of the sort of things that he's saying that go beyond merely propositional knowledge and thinking about science in this way, I think is very important. Now, whether or not how far we're going to get with all this and how pragmatism is we're going to be at the end will be interesting. But so far I'm on board with the project. I think it's super interesting. Did I say it's interesting? Interesting. <laughs> oh man, I suck. Okay.